Editing is cheating, they say. Do you think that? What are they on about? Let's find out. Hi, I'm Adam and welcome back to First Man Photography. And in today's video, I'm gonna share some tips about how we can better process our photos to enhance our creative vision. An attempt to put the debate to bed about why editing is not cheating. Before we get going today though, this video is sponsored by MPB. If you want to buy, sell or trade your gear, do it with MPB. So why do some people believe that editing your photos is cheating? I think it comes from the inherent nature of photography. Painting and drawing were always very obviously an interpretation, but when photography came along, it was essentially capturing the light and people immediately associated a photograph with a record of reality. And I believe this is something that should still be respected because that is still most people's base understanding or belief. We see this with the outrage caused every time a high profile image is exposed as being stage manipulated or faked. Everything from an Afghan girl to clouds behind the moon. It is still very important for documentary photography to be an accurate representation of reality. But really what I'm talking about in this video is where we are making a piece of art, creative photography, which amongst other, other things would include landscape, street, and macro photography. And what I do as a landscape photographer is not a documentary. I make an image based on what I see combined with an interpretation based on my feelings about that scene. And much of that latter part is done in the post-processing stage. What the editing is cheating crowd do not understand is that all photography ever done has gone through some form of processing. This was true of film in the darkroom and it remains the case with digital. Even when you look at a raw file straight out of camera, it's very flat and doesn't, doesn't show the contrast, color and sharpness that we actually see with our own eyes. So even a small amount of editing becomes necessary. We then have those who proclaim they get it right in camera as they proudly share their JPEGs with a sense of moral superiority. Ultimately, what these people don't understand is that they are giving up part of the photographic process to the software in their cameras, which is doing the editing for them. So where is the line? How much is too much editing? I feel like it's important to say here that I am not the gatekeeper. We're talking about art and there is no way I would ever dream of saying what you can, can't, should or shouldn't do. I am, however, willing to stick my neck out and say that I do not want to be deceived when I am looking at an image. I'm a fan of composite photography because we're in on it. It's designed to shock, surprise and delight us, but it's not deceiving us because we know what's happening. This piece from Joe Cornish is an excellent example where he's combined two images to give the impression of the rock above and below the ground. It's incredible work. As a landscape photographer, part of my brand is my love of nature. I'm always banging on about the beauty of the natural world, how connecting with it is good for our well-being, and how it looks amazing in all different weather conditions. But imagine how you'd feel if you suddenly discovered nearly all my images contained large parts that were fabricated on a computer. Particularly if you'd been following me for a long time and even bought some of my work, you'd be feeling very cheated. I don't buy all this willful ignorance around all this either. If you swap a sky and allow people to believe that was a real experience, then you know what you're doing. Let's not pretend. It's also why I dislike AI in photography so much, because it's making it far too easy to distort reality and taking us down that uncanny valley at a time when we're crying out for something more meaningful, with more authenticity, integrity, and honesty. When I sit down to edit my photos, I think about my adjustments in two ways, subjective and objective. In the subjective category, I would place things like color, brightness, contrast, and sharpness. These are things where we really don't know how each other perceive them, so we have a wide range of creative freedom, and we'll take a look at how we can use some of those things to our, to our advantage 
in a minute. The objective category for me is when we change actual objects, people, or the light source in the photograph. It's when we mess around with these things that I think we start to move away from that intrinsic record of reality idea that underpins photography. For my brand of photography though, I will virtually never add objects to a scene and only occasionally remove small distracting objects like rocks, branches, and bits of litter I couldn't reach to pick up. If you've been watching my recent videos where I talked about the artistic elements, then you will know that colour is one of them and obviously plays a huge part in photography. Colour helps to set the mood, it triggers emotions and is probably the primary element that can tie images together into a cohesive series. These days with RAW files and the most recent editing software, we now have almost total control over the colour in our images, mostly through a combination of white balance, curves, hue, saturation, luminance controls, and finally colour grading. Combine this with the fact that we really have no idea how each of us perceive colour, it gives us a lot of artistic freedom. As a landscape photographer, often the colour is dictated to us by the scene, but when I say I'm matching what I see with how I feel, colour plays a big role in the feeling part. So for example, being from the UK, it's very green, and I guess I either take it for granted or don't notice it as much, but I almost always end up desaturating the greens in my images. They're usually not the focus, so I want to kind of reduce the attention on them, uh, and the more saturated a colour appears, the more it demands the viewer's attention. Another example of how I use colour is with images shot on grey and miserable days, except I don't find them miserable. I love those kinds of days. Being out and about in the thick of it, usually with the entire landscape to myself. But then when I first view the raw file, it always does look grey and shitty. So I do two things depending on the scene. With some images, I will add a blue tone, usually just by shifting the white balance, and it returns something literally cooler and more interesting that matches my enjoyment of that moment. Secondly, I will sometimes add my bad weather preset, which just returns this deep, powerful and dramatic mood that I was feeling whilst I was there. One adjustment that no one ever considers to be cheating though is when we remove the colour entirely and turn it black and white. With nearly all my black and white images, I will add a slight blue tone and I love the colour grading feature in Lightroom for this because it lets us add tones globally to the image, which means you have the ability to add your own signature look to your black and white images. I've been working on a new black and white preset recently designed for moody beaches, and not only does it turn it black and white, but it creates a really punchy contrast, uh, and it does this by carefully controlling the brightness, which is possibly our most powerful element in the editing room, and we're going to discuss that next. Before we do though, as you know, this video is sponsored by MPB. Now MPB is the world's largest platform to buy, sell and trade used photography and video kits. I recently decided to sell some of the gear I don't use much anymore, one of which was this Canon 17 to 40 millimeter wide angle lens. I was sad to see it go, but selling it with MPB was extremely easy and removed all the faff I usually experience when selling gear. I just went on their website, hit the start selling button, typed in what I wanted to sell and told them the condition that I thought it was in, which in my case, I think was excellent. MPB immediately then gave me a quote that I was happy with and provided me with a shipping label so I could send it to them fully insured for free. And a couple of days later, they received the lens, checked it over and agreed that it was in excellent condition. Then all I had to do was give them my bank details and a short time later, the money appeared in my account. To be honest, I was blown away by the service. And since then, I've, I've been scratching around trying to find any other gear that I can sell. So hit the link down below and check out MPB if you want to buy, sell or trade your photography gear. So when we talk about brightness in our images, we are really talking about another artistic element called value. When our photographs are printed, they don't really have any brightness because they don't emit light. 
but the illusion of light is created using value, which is essentially how light or dark something is in our photograph, from absolute black to absolute white. This was the basis of Ansel Adams' zone system that you can see here. So if you have two objects in an image with a similar value, then the contrast will be low. If the value of the objects is further apart, this is what creates contrast. So here I reduce the value of the circle on the left towards black and increase the value of the one on the right towards white. And now we have a much greater, punchier, contrast. Now this becomes extremely useful when editing our images because the brighter and more contrasty areas of your photograph will demand much more attention than the darker parts. So we can then use this to guide the viewer's eye in our images using the whole variety of controls that are available to us. So let's look again at the Moody Beach preset. You can see in the images there is a very punchy contrast, which I used to create that sort of powerful and dramatic feeling. But I've also used a gradient filter to darken off the sky from the top, and then a pretty strong radial filter to brighten that central part of the photo, which draws your attention into those areas where I think the interest and detail is contained. The darker areas around the outside now act as negative space, framing the detailed areas and providing some context. You can also start thinking about this stuff whilst you're at the scene. Take this image here, where the effect is very similar, but I achieved it in part by purposely underexposing the frame to darken the surrounding wood. I want to exploit that contrast essentially. So by underexposing the image across the whole frame, the water will still be nicely exposed, the rock will be very dark, I'll have that moody feel, which almost creates like a, a natural vignette around that waterfall, and that's how it's gonna work. So when you're editing your photos, instead of just randomly adding contrast and saturation, think about taking the viewer on a journey through your image. Where do you want the eye to go? Which parts demand the attention? If there is something distracting in your frame, you don't always have to clone it out either. Try using a brush to reduce the saturation, brightness, or sharpness to take its attention away. Think about why you are making these edits. Do you want your image to look as natural and as subtle as possible? Or do you want it to be a big, bright, colorful image that punches you in the face? By shifting your editing away from a technical process to a more creative and artistic one, over time, you'll almost certainly start to see a style emerge. Your images will improve along with your sense of fulfillment as we create meaningful photography that is most definitely authentic. <laughs> so I hope you enjoyed that. Click here, here, if you want to learn about printing your photos or click here if you want to come on a landscape photography adventure with me or click down below to check out MPB and sell some of your gear. I'll see you again soon.